I want to talk about the well-known Modigliani and Miller theorem of capital structure. The Modigliani and Miller theorem is a theory that Franco Modigliani and Merton Miller came up with in the late 50s that deals with the capital structure of the firm and it relates it to the value of the firm as well as the weighted average cost of capital. Okay, both of them would go on to win the Nobel Prize in economics actually in different years and this is one of the reasons they won it. Um, they broke it up into two different propositions. M&M Proposition 1 deals with the value of the firm and M&M Proposition 2 deals with the weighted average cost of capital. Now, what they did is they broke it up into different cases. This is, this is quite common in research. Let's, let's come up with a theory. Let's look at it in, under unrealistic assumptions, and then we'll start to relax the assumptions and make them more realistic and see how the model holds up. And the first case was the most unrealistic assumption. There are no corporate or personal taxes, and there are no bankruptcy costs. Okay, That's what we're going to discuss in this tutorial. In uh, future tutorials, we'll look at case two, where there are corporate taxes, but there's still no bankruptcy costs, and then case three, where there are corporate taxes as well as bankruptcy costs. Now, let's take a look at the first one. The first one, in case one, okay, no taxes, no bankruptcy costs, proposition one argues that the value of the firm is not going to be affected by changes in the capital structure. That is, if you change the amount of stock and debt that you use to finance the firm, it has no impact on the value of the firm. And the reason for that is, is that the cash flows of the firm haven't changed, and therefore the value of the firm doesn't change. And a common way this gets depicted is by using a pie model. The argument is, is that no matter how you slice the pie, it's still the same size. And the value of the firm, that's the pie, is made up of the amount of stock and the amount of bonds the firm has. So in this case, we have 40% uh, stock and 60% bonds. Here, we change the percentage, so now we have something like 70% stock and 30% bonds, but the size of the pie hasn't changed. So the value of the firm hasn't changed. Okay, Proposition 2 looks at the weighted average cost of capital and it makes an argument that or M&M &M make an argument that the uh, weighted average cost of capital is not affected by the capital structure and they came up with these equations here now we know the weighted average cost of capital is just an average of the return that equity holders require and the return that debt holders require so E divided by V is the proportion of the firm that's financed using equity. Okay, Remember that the value of the firm equals E plus D. And the proportion of the firm financed by debt is D divided by V. So the weighted average cost of capital is take the percentage of the firm financed by equity, multiply it by the return to equity, plus the percentage of the firm financed by debt times the return to debt. If you do some algebra, you can rearrange and solve for the return on equity. And we'll take a look and see what that looks like in an example. But first, let's take a look at a graph. Here's a graph that actually comes from the uh, Ross Westerfield Jordan textbook. And what it shows you is down here we have the return to debt it's a horizontal line because the return to debt doesn't change. Here we have a line that slopes upward and this is the return to equity. And the reason it slopes upward is that as we use more debt we increase the risk that shareholders face and therefore they require a higher rate of return. But notice that the weighted average cost of capital stays the same even when we're using more debt. And we can see that by looking at a little um, at another part of the equation or looking at this 
equation for the return on equity, we can see that the return on equity has two components. It has a component that deals with the business risk, and it has a component that deals with the financial risk. When you increase the amount of leverage that's being used, that is, you're increasing the debt equity ratio, you are changing the financial risk. But if you think about it, the business risk hasn't changed. Okay, if this is Ford, just because they've borrowed more money, it doesn't make it any harder to sell a car. Okay, the business itself is still the same. So this will go up, but this will stay the same. And let's take a look at a, at a numerical example. Okay, here I've actually already written it out. We have this company, and they have a weighted average cost of capital, which is the same as the return on assets of 15%. The return to debt is 9%. And there's a target debt equity ratio. The old target was 70% equity, 30% debt. And we want to see how that compares if they change their target to using more debt, a case where they use 50% debt, uh, debt and 50% equity. So let's, let's start by taking a look at that equation where we're going to look at the return on equity is equal to the return on assets, okay, which is the same as the weighted average cost of capital, plus we're going to take the difference between the return on assets and the return on debt times the debt equity ratio. So if we substitute in, let's see what we get here. We have 15% is the return to assets plus 15% minus 9% and the debt equity ratio is 0.3 divided by 0.7. So 0.3 divided by 0.7 equals uh, 0.42857. We want to multiply that by 15 minus 9, which is 6, and then add this to 15 and we get 17.57%. So if we're using a target debt equity ratio of 70% equity and 30% debt, equity holders, stockholders, will require 17.57% return. Now let's see what happens in the case where we have a a debt equity ratio of 0.5 for debt and 0.5 to equity. Still going to be 15% plus 15 minus 9. In this case, it's going to be 0.5 over 0.5, which is 1. So that's going to be 15 minus 9 is 6. So this is going to be 21%. So we can see that the return that equity requires has gone up as we've increased the debt equity ratio from 0.42, I think it was, to 1. But let's see what's ha happened to the weighted average cost of capital. The weighted average cost of capital is going to be the proportion of, of equity we use times the return that equity holders require. So in this case, it's going to be 21%, which we worked out before, plus 50% times the return that debt holders require, which was 9%. Okay, half of 21 is 10 and a half. Half of 9 is 4 and a half. 10 and a half plus 4 and a half is 15. And that is the same weighted average cost of capital that we started with. So if we actually went back to this graph here, you can see that we moved, let's say from here, where the return to equity was 17 and a half, over to here where the return was 21, if you drew across, but 
what happened? The weighted average cost of capital stayed the same. So that's uh, proposition two of the Modigliani-Miller theorem under the assumption that there are no taxes and no bankruptcy costs. In the next tutorial, we'll take a look at the case where we add taxes, but we still don't have bankruptcy costs, case two.